Good morning, Eastview. Welcome here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we gather together as the church week after week, we do so to encourage and to spur each other on to live into the reality of what it means to be people of God, living in the kingdom of God. This morning we gather, we gather to pray, we gather to worship our Heavenly Father, we gather to read the Word of God and encounter the, present, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit which empowers us to live life on mission in this new reality of the kingdom. God calls us as his followers to worship him in spirit and in truth, with our words, with our thoughts, and with our actions. And Jesus says to his followers that we worship what we treasure. We worship what we treasure. And he warned us not to worship things that won't last. So this morning, we are here to worship the God who is everlasting and give him all of our worship and all of our praise. Would you stand? Would you pray with me as we continue in worship this morning? God, you are holy, and you are good, and you are mighty, and God, you are so worthy of our worship and our praise. Thank you for calling us out of a life of sin and for redeeming us by the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit. Would you meet us here in this place, in these moments as we gather together as your church and worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. i 
call my friend Mark Workington on behalf of the board and you're only here really to talk about numbers all the time, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, usually it's James Fast, but okay. he's on a well-deserved vacation, and okay. so I get the honor of yeah. talking about financial. Just, you know, Mark knows lots of things about lots of things. He only just talks about money. But uh, yeah. I, we should talk some other time about something else. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, Mark. Awesome. Thanks, Welcome Steve. <laughs> so today is actually a really good day to do the financial update because we are doing very well. Uh, if I can get the slide up there. Um, you can see uh, this year is the, the red line and we have, been, we have been improving over the last few years and that is so amazing to see and we are so blessed um, to, to be in a place where we are. And I am so encouraged to see what is happening within Eastview. Um, I've got a verse here from 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I am so encouraged to hear this and to read this, and I see it within Eastview, and I'm so encouraged to see where God is going to take us in the future. And so I encourage you to, to give with, your, with what your, your, your heart is telling you to give um, and to continue moving on in, the, in, that, uh, in that way. Um, something else when we're talking about budgets is that we are preparing a budget for, for next year. And we are going to be having our AGM uh, in the month of May, and it's going to be on the 21st of May. And uh, I encourage everyone to come and attend there. We're going to be we're going to be looking at what uh, the budget will look like in the in the future, and we're also going to be talking about um, our organizational structure and our constitution. We opened up those uh, those documents, and there's going to be a few changes. And so we want in the next few months or in the month leading up, we're going to have some meetings to talk and discuss and to see what what those changes are going to be. And so and we will vote on those changes at the at the AGM. And so I encourage everybody to come uh, because we have to meet quorum to to pass those those changes. So, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, enjoy. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to take an offering now. Um, is that coincidence or on purpose? The re regardless of, uh, thank you, Mark, for sharing, but regardless of our uh, jesting about that, I, I shouldn't make light of it. This is what God asked us to do, and John is going to uh, talk about that a little bit later. But for now, we get to give back to what God is doing here and through here. So let's just pray for that this morning. God, we're so grateful to be in your house and to be in community and to learn together and to grow together and to be challenged together. And God, this morning as we give our tithe and our offering, we do this as an act of worship, as an act of love for you, as an act of thanksgiving, uh, as a way we can partner with you in the things you are asking us to do as a church and as a community. So God, may you bless this moment where you bless this worship time. May this be a sweet aroma to you, a sweet offering, uh, a gift to you. May you bless, bless those who give. And with whatever we receive this morning, God, we just pray that you would do abundantly more than we could ask or imagine or dream to build your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. to the cross. 
Thanks so much, Steve and worship team, for leading us this morning. Uh, good morning. My name is Johnny. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Eastview. Just have a few announcements to share with you this morning. Uh, first off, on Thursday, Thursday at noon, our Mexico team returned home uh, from Mexico. Uh, they were in Cancun serving with Back to Back, which is a partner with our family ministry at Eastview, and they had just an incredible time. We're going to be sharing some stories from them and some services up ahead, but if you see any of these people around, go and ask them, welcome them back and say, how was your trip? And man, do they have stories to share with you. With the Mexico team returning, we're already geared into our next mission trip that's coming up next February. We are sending a team back to Thailand uh, to work with our global mission partners, Dave and Louise Sinclair Peters. Lots more that we're going to share about that in the weeks ahead, but if you'd like to hear more about that, you can pick up an application package at the Welcome Center or come find me uh, or anyone who was on the team last time. We'd love to share some of our stories from that trip with you, and we're excited to be heading back. Coming up on May 5th, we have a baptism and membership class happening here at ECU. I just want to note we made a date change for that class, so previously it was listed as April 28th. The class is now happening May 5th after the second service. You can stay for lunch uh, and be a part of the orientation to baptism and membership. If you believe Jesus is Lord and you want to follow him with your life, Scripture declares you ready for baptism. And if you've been a part of, of life here at Eastview for a while and you're a follower of Jesus and you want to become a member, Scripture also talks about membership and joining in with the membership of the church. Uh, that's some of the stuff we're going to be unpacking in the class. Uh, and if God is inviting you to that, we would love to have you there. You can register on the website. Finally, the middle school retreat is coming up May 3rd to 5th. This is for kids who are in grades 5 to 8. So parents, make sure you're aware of that. If you have a middle schooler in your household, register them for this retreat. You can go to eastview.org to register. Well, coming up this weekend, Friday and Saturday of this coming weekend, uh, Nikki White from Multiply in Abbotsford will be joining us to lead our church through something called the Prayer Ministry Training Workshop. Nikki is a good friend of mine, and we had uh, the opportunity to serve together for a number of years uh, at a church, an MB church in the Lower Mainland. Uh, and I've seen firsthand Nikki's heart and love for the church and her heart for prayer and how she has been a catalyst for growing a deep heart of prayer in the local MB church. And so I am really, really, really excited that we have the opportunity to have Nikki White join us here next weekend and offer what she has to us in growing a heart of prayer here at Eastview. Here's a little snippet of what she's going to be covering in the training. Let's take a look. Hey Eastview, it's Nikki White, writer and prayer mobilizer with Multiply, our global mission agency with the North American MB conferences. We're going to get together really soon and look at prayer and prayer ministry. We'll be tackling topics like vision, vocation, praxis, and perspectives on the charismatic. Vision, why pray? What actually happens when image-bearing royal priests pray? Vocation, how do the different aspects of the royal priesthood shape my prayer life? And how can we discern and affirm the image of God in others when we're praying for them? Praxis, how can we use the Lord's Prayer as a model for prayer ministry? And finally, perspectives, how can we use the gifts of the Spirit in biblical, balanced, and helpful ways to pray for others and transform their lives? We'll see you soon. Awesome. So over the last year at Eastview, we've been talking about how to be a people after God's own heart. And being a church that prays is a big part of what it means to be a people who are after God's own heart. In the Gospels and just about every single letter written to the early churches, the believers, the churches, they are called to pray. They're called to pray for God to work powerfully in and through them so that they can be a light in a dark world. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes, Pray at all times. <clears throat> pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Prayer is the way that we partner with God to accomplish the things that he wants to do in our world. And it's so important for us to be a church that prays. And as a leadership, we want to grow in this heart of prayer here at Eastview. 
So our invitation for you is to take part in this training happening Friday and Saturday. We'd love to have you join us. It's $35 per person, which covers the cost of a workbook and snacks and lunch throughout the weekend. Uh, if cost is a problem for you, please come talk to me. We would love to find a way to make you get there. Um, and we'd just love to have you join us as we lean in and grow into this heart of prayer together as a church. Now, with talking about prayer, I want to pray for John, who's going to come up and lead us through uh, reflecting on the Word of God and what it has to teach us and say to us on this topic of stewardship. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word, which reveals your wisdom to the church in, in our world today. You call us to a radical way to live into the kingdom and stewardship, how we treat the things that, that we have been given is a huge, huge part of what it means to live in the kingdom. Would you open our eyes? Would you open our ears? Would you open our hearts to the truth that you want to teach us this morning? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So on spring break, Rose and I went out to BC because it's teacher's week off, right? And uh, we got to spend some time with our kids who are also teachers. And uh, they're expecting a baby. And uh, so this is sort of the last time we'll get to spend before their lives change in ways that they can't even figure out yet, and it's just going to happen to them. They know it's coming, but they don't really know what's coming. You know how that is. And, uh, and well, teachers, Cam and Rose, they like their sleep in. It's the week they get to do it. Levi and I were morning people, and so we got the morning, just the two of us, to go for coffee, to go for breakfast. We would go into North Langley, which is where they live, and, uh, and found my favorite cafe there for breakfast, which is called Trails End, right on the Fraser River. And uh, we talk, as Levi and I often do, about politics, about uh, big ideas. He loves big ideas. And, uh, and about money. He's often been very much the one to ask me questions and to challenge me and say, so what about? And, and both money in our world, but also in personal lives. And when you live in the Lower Mainland and you're trying to figure out how to pay for buying a house and you've got a family coming, it rises to the top of your thinking, I can tell you that. And so one, one of the times that we're sitting there in Trails End, watching the river go by, uh, I believe I persuaded me to order Eggs Benedict, which wasn't a difficult thing to persuade me, but it was fresh caught uh, Pacific salmon. And, and, uh, and he goes, so dad, um, I don't know how we're gonna do it. Like paying for a house on two salaries would be a stretch. Uh, if Tam's on mat leave, like how do, how do we do this? And the conversation goes around that, and, and, and then he goes, yeah, and I was doing my taxes, and my accountant says, I need your charitable donation receipt still, and so I sent it to her, and it says, like, I realize that not much has changed since university. Like, I tithed all the time in university, but then I got a full-time job and got married, and, and I pretty much haven't changed the way I'm giving, so, like, how do I get started again? H how do I dig back into this? And he was asking really practical, not big idea, really practical questions. And, uh, and so I said, like, how, what did we teach you? He said, well, give, save, spend, like in that order. Okay, and, and, and so, so how's that going? He said, well, the saving's not a problem because I'm motivated because we want to get a house. Um, and the spending, well, there's always a place for the money to go. It's the giving part that I need to think about. So, so I said, well, once you've spilled your coffee, you can't really get it back into the cup. Once you've spilled your coffee, once you've spent your money, it, it's difficult to get it back and, and give again. Catching up is, is also really challenging. And, and so when you think about finances, and this is a conversation that I've had with my kids, and I hope you as families have it too in really transparent ways. Once you get a paycheck, think about fulfilling your responsibilities. Think about managing your spending and and dealing with your debt. These are all important parts of being a financial steward. You see, we are given money by God. All the resources we have and possess are gifts to us from God to steward, which means that it's not my money. It's not your money. It's God's money, and we get to do something with it. And the biggest challenges to giving very often are we've got our order of operations wrong. 
I'm not much of a math guy, to be really honest, but I know that you've got to take care of the equation that's inside the brackets. There's a certain order of operations. And so in life, how do you give, save, and spend? See, spending and debt are, are the biggest enemies quite often of giving because we've placed them in the wrong order in our lives. And we find ourselves paralyzed and frustrated and anxious and, and we feel guilt and shame. And, and sometimes we lose motion and momentum and motivation. And, and that's just part of living financially is that we have to reckon with these things. And so not understanding the nature of stewardship is most often the biggest obstacle that we have in, in giving, in sharing and being generous. You see, all this money that you and I possess because we get a paycheck, it's not ours in the first place. It's God's. And God entrusts us with these resources to make a difference in the lives of others. So how you use your money is actually a significant indicator of your values. And are your values, are your priorities shaped by God? And so Levi and I are having this conversation. And, and as the conversation goes, he goes, so what about tithing, Dad? Really? Like 10%. How do you make that work? And I go, well, the problem with tithing is the word itself is a problem. We often think about tithing as tenth tithing, but except in the Bible, there's actually three tithes. There's a temple tithe every year. That goes to the running of this temple that the Hebrew people gathered at regularly. It was a grand place, and major things happened there. In fact, there were major storehouses. They collected resources so that in times of economic disaster when crops failed there was something to share around and there was a savings account in the temple to provide for the nation and the Levites there was another 10 percent a Levite tithe the Levites weren't given land when God gave all the Hebrew people land they were set apart and they became tradesmen and craftsmen they served in the temple and they served their local communities and because they didn't have land they didn't have a basis of economics um, God said, a tenth of your finances go to provide for the Levites in your communities. And then every third year, there was another tithe. And this was a, a gathering of a tenth of your harvest, which was supposed to be stored up so that the poor, the widow, the orphan, the needy person, the, the person who was coming through as a foreigner and didn't have anything that you could provide for them. So the problem with tithing is that it's not actually 10%. It's something like 23% when you think about it over time. And after a while, once you do this for a while, you think of it as a tax, not as a tithe. And, and most of us, when we think about taxes, we have feelings of resistance and resentment. And we're going, like, why? It's just too much. And what am I getting it for? And, and we have this sense of, I need to get something back for it. See, the challenge with tithing is often a heart challenge, not actually a money challenge. It's a challenge about our attitudes towards our responsibilities and and. And we don't see the benefit coming to us, and so we think there is no benefit. In the Bible, we find that Jesus calls us to have freedom from the law. In fact, Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law. And we told, well, that means we don't have to tithe anymore. I have to 10% or 23%, whatever your number is, because now I'm free. I can, as Johnny shared earlier in a scripture and Mark shared earlier, like you can give what you feel called to, which means like I don't feel called to very much because I don't see the personal benefits. So like 3% is just fine. See, the problem with tithing is so often we have a heart problem and we're not joyful in it. We're, we're, we're not experiencing the joy of giving and, and the way we can bless others and partner with God in life. And then when we look at the Bible, we see that in the New Testament, there is this radical generosity that seems to go well beyond anything called the tithe. Just think of the early church. In, in Acts chapter 2, how um, it says that as they gathered together, there were no needy persons among them. They shared their possessions and the mo their money with those in need. They, they shared wildly and generously it says in Acts chapter 4 that all the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's blessing was on them all. And there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them 
and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. At this point, Levi and I are in our conversation. Uh, he's going like, yeah, you got to be able to afford a house, to have a house, to be able to sell a house. And, and that just seems so far off. So far off. And, and so as we were thinking about these things, we realized that the generosity that's expressed in the New Testament because of Jesus and his death and resurrection is so much greater than anything that would be described as tithing. See, stewardship is the, the use of all of our resources, all of our resources for God's benefit, which means it's not what you put in the plate. It's not what you share in the basket. It is that, but it's much more. It's what do you do with your house and the way it's open to your neighbors, the way you can use your house to bless this community, the, the way you host in Show hospitality. What do you do with your time and the, the way you invest in the lives of other people? Because time is money in so many of our thinking. How we use our time is an important part of our stewardship. And certainly the ways we spend our money on ourselves, our, our leisure, our pleasure, our comfort, it, it tells a story about our own values and our, the significant things in our lives. And so the heart of the matter is Jesus talks about money a lot. He has lots of examples of giving in Scripture. He has lots of examples that play themselves out in the early church. And so the question is, how does this address our hearts? And once we think about it in our hearts, how does it challenge our practices? How does it challenge the way we manage our money? You see, for a 29-year-old man who's got a baby on the way, who's thinking about his career and his wife's career, and do they turn a mat leave into her staying home with the kids, or do they got to go back to work? And if you go back to work, uh, the cost of daycare almost is the amount of money you take home, and the math just doesn't work. They, this is real stuff. And if you're not in this yet, you will be maybe, and maybe others remember what it was like and how hard it was in those days. So giving, if it's about the heart, should be in Scripture a call to be joyful. So talking with my son, he raised the question because it mattered to him. I didn't have to raise it with him. He raised the questions because it matters to him, and he just wants to find a way. A big part of that is the joy of giving, the joy of giving sacrificially in ways that actually inconvenience me. They, it actually means I'm going to surrender my privileges, my preferences, my entitlements, and I'm going to say this is going to cost me something, not just in cash, but in the ways I spend my life. In fact, I might give to the point where it actually gets really uncomfortable. What is it for us to give worshipfully? And what is it for us to be spirit-led in our giving? Especially when we think about how do we respond to the needs for justice and the needs to address the circumstances of the poor in our city, but also in our congregation. And it's about living in community like we saw in Acts. So, I had the conversation with Levi. What does your church website say? And literally, he pulls out his phone, and sure enough, his church website, like our church website, has ways of giving electronically and automating your giving. And, and this is an important thing that we talk about in terms of financial management. Automate your responsibilities. Your mortgage, your rent, it goes out of your account right away. If you're saving for something big, you've often pre-assigned some of your money to automatically go to a savings account for that thing. And, uh, and often you've got financial commitments towards retirement, and, and so you automate those things too so they don't slip out of your grasp when you find yourself in a bad place later. So what is it for us to automate our generosity? Well, does it take the heart of it out? Does it take the joy of giving out if you've automated and it just immediately goes out of your account after your paycheck? And as we're talking about that, um, Levi goes, but I saw you and mom give. I saw you give at the dining room table. Uh, and, and this is how I said, like, well, like, remind me what you saw. It's always an interesting thing to do something and then see how your kids observe what you did. And Levi goes, well, you and mom, uh, anytime somebody came to the door canvassing for Heart and Stroke or for, uh, for the Lighthouse or Salome Mission, um, you looked at each other, you picked the number, and then you split the difference, and that's what you gave. 
It was a great practice. Early in our marriage, we started doing this. We each picked a number, and we split the difference, and that's what we gave. Uh, it immediately responded to needs that were presented to us, not just the plan of what we had automated. Over time, Rose and my values began to merge and become very much the same as we understood each other's priorities, as we understood each other's concerns and our passions, and we began to give. And now the day happens when somebody gives us an opportunity. We get a letter in our mailbox. Hey, I'm going to camp. Would you support me? And we pick a number, and it's almost more often than not, the same number. Splitting the difference is the number we've chosen because our hearts have found a common purpose in giving and in generosity. I believe I reflected on this. Give, save, spend. And the opportunities that he had to give and the joy that he had giving when he just did it spontaneously, which seemed different than on a Sunday morning or with a plan and automating it. And so we had to talk about the heart. Well, if you can't get the spilled coffee back into the cup, there's another problem in our lives. What happens when we get more and more and more and the cup isn't full enough? Jesus told a story about exactly this kind of circumstance, a bigger barn story. And if you turn to Luke chapter 12, I invite you to grab a Bible there in your seat pocket in front of you or the one that you brought yourself. And we're going to read some scripture together. And we're going to do a little tour of what Jesus says and then how it works itself out in the teaching of the church. And, and Levi and I actually looked at these scriptures at the Trails End Cafe and had a great conversation about this. Luke chapter 12. Um, some guy calls out to Jesus as Jesus is teaching and says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This starts at verse 13. Luke chapter 12. Tell my brother to invite the inheritance with me. And Jesus replies, Man, who appointed me judge or arbiter? between you. In other words, don't get me involved in your money. Don't get me in the middle of your relationship with your brother about this. And then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. As we live here in East St. Paul, as we are in a very comfortable city, in a very prosperous country, be careful about the abundance of possessions. And then he tells them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your very life will be demanded from you. Then you will be get what you have prepared for yourself. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. What is it for us when we live in a prosperous world to continue with the idea of bigger barns? We must accumulate more. And what do we do with the more when it comes our way? And Jesus warns us about the problem in our hearts. In fact, he calls this guy a damned fool, literally. Tonight, your life is going to be taken from you. Because guess what? You have gotten your priorities so far out of whack that they have changed your heart in pretty devastating ways. And it says in these words that Jesus follows, and, and it goes for... The better part of the chapter, actually, Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, or about your body, what you wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. In other words, don't be consumed about your finances. It's really important that you manage your finances, but you ought not to become consumed by them. So if you're worried about the bills... If you find yourself anxious when you pull the envelopes out of the mailbox and you see the MasterCard statement. If a conversation with your spouse is filled with stress because you're just so close to the edge. Jesus is saying, the, the money has taken the wrong place in your life and the place that it's gotten to you is actually doing spiritual and relational harm. It's doing mental health damage. The crazy thing is, it doesn't matter 
how little much money you have or how much money you have, we can all be consumed by it. Some of us are consumed by what do we do so we can really get ahead. And some people go, I can't ever see getting above water. And then we get down to verse 29, where Jesus says, Do not set your heart on what you'll eat or drink, or what... There we go. <clears throat> or... Uh, and do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after such things, and your Father knows what you need. Here's a little indicator for us. If money is the thing that drives you, be aware that Jesus says, it's the thing that drives the pagan world. Are you being sucked into it? And then he continues, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near, no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus wasn't saying live broke. He was saying be wildly generous and have a kingdom-oriented perspective, a God-oriented perspective about what to do with your money, how to manage it, so that it is something that is your responsibility to steward on God's behalf instead of it managing you. So often, I find that people are managed by their money. They aren't managing their money. And so let's take a look at how this actually works out in the church, because Paul, in particular, but taught a lot about money, sprinkled in here and there, because he knew that it affected our faith. It shaped our world and our worldview. So turn with me to the right to... Uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and there's some uh, really powerful teaching right here. Jesus, Paul says to the church, first few verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, now about the collection for the Lord's people. So there's this regular practice, now about the correct collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian church to do. In other words, this is the common practice. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I'll give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me also to go, then they will accompany me. In other words, stewardship is something that involves a plan. Stewardship is a rhythm of life. The collecting of resources to have an impact, to make a difference, to be generous, to meet needs, is something that the church organized itself around. So while tithing may not be a thing anymore because Jesus brought the Old Testament law to completion, that doesn't mean we become undisciplined, spontaneous, and unthinking in our practices, just reflexively giving when we think about it and when there's a bit extra. In fact, Paul goes on and he says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he has a whole bunch of teaching in chapter 8 and chapter 9. I encourage you to turn your, your page there. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And Paul says, now, about, now brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In other words, you should know Corinth, this city that I'm writing to, that the Macedonian churches, the churches up north, God is doing some really cool things. What would it be for Paul to write that about Eastview? To say, you should know, church, that the things that God is doing in Eastview are pretty incredible because the stewardship of their lives and their resources is making a massive difference in their city. And he continues, in the midst of their very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Now, how's that for a math equation? In the midst of severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty equals rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service for the Lord's people. 
Have you ever been out with a friend and you know that they're financially in a tough spot and you go to pay the bill and they grab the bill first and you go like, I can afford it. They can't. Their desire to contribute means something. The heart of generosity welling up in them, being an equal person in the relationship, it matters to them. And that's exactly what's happening here in this church. And it says they gave themselves first, in verse 5, they gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. And then Paul gets really sarcastic with them, like really sarcastic. Read verse 7. He says, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love that we have kindled about among you. Like, since you've got it all together, see also that you excel in giving. In other words, you think you're all that, but you're cheap. You think you're all that, but you're stingy. You think you're all that, but you're actually all about yourself. This is the sort of thing that could be said of many of our lives because we get consumed in the rat race and the hamster wheel of success of more, of prosperity, of what will other people think about us. And then he continues in verse 9, for by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. And then all through these next verses, this is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first, not only to give, but also in the desire to do it. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion. In other words, you have first to the promise, you're first to the commitment, but it was all good intentions. You see, good intentions without a plan often come to nothing. And so Rose and I, in our relationship, we've automated our giving. And it actually makes a huge difference in the life of the church when we do this together because it creates a stable line. Like the, mark, the graph that Mark showed before of ups and downs is partially because we are spontaneous with our giving. We're not disciplined. And God calls us to the act of discipline in this. And, and Paul says this in verse 13, chapter 8. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but there there might be equality. You see, our discipline in giving allows us to bless and care for others far beyond ourselves. If we are only ever responding to our immediate need, we are never wildly generous beyond ourselves. There's camps. COVID kicked the butt of our camps financially. If we're able to do this together, think of how our camps could thrive beyond ourselves. That's just one example of many, many things where we can make a big difference. And that's what Paul's calling us. At the present time, verse 14, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. The one who's gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. There's not a problem with bigger barns. There's not a problem of figuring out what to do with the surplus in this way. And then Paul continues on in, verse, in chapter 9, starting uh, in verse 7, just a little bit to the right. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then in verse 10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Here is this dramatic thing that happens in the life of God's people when we become stewards. And so if you're in high school, let me challenge you to have a conversation with your parents about their finances. Don't wait for them to come and talk to you. Levi initiated the conversation with me as he's thinking about having kids and a mortgage and and all of these things. And the thing that he raised in the question was tithing because it mattered to him. It was on his conscience. 
have a conversation with your parents. It might be awkward for them. They might have made it awkward for you when, you had the se- when they had the sex talk with you. You can make it awkward with them by having a financial conversation with them. It's fair, isn't it? Ask them how they're really doing. Understand the ways debt has impacted their lives over the years and how they've managed it. Understand what their extra does. Understand how you can participate in your own financial planning. Parents, take the responsibility to teach your children financial management. If, and if you're not good at it, get somebody who is, who helps you. I'm not good at the explaining part, but if you're not good at financial management, get somebody who is good at it to help you and help your children. See, this is a kingdom thing, not just a personal prosperity thing, because God gives us all of these resources to make a difference in our world. The largest amount of our money that goes outside of our budget here at Eastview that leaves our 315 Maxwell King Drive address goes to 188. You know what 188 is a community that does not have the resources that we do. And therefore we partner so that out of our generosity they will not find themselves short. And guess what? Their spiritual generosity to us also makes a difference. Just talk to our kids who were on SOAR this last week. Their spiritual generosity of that community also blesses us and impacts us. That's the equality of the kingdom. And so, when we think about this, tithing isn't a problem. It's only a problem if you're legalistic about money. But tithing, it's a spirit-led thing. It takes prayer. It takes fellowship. It takes discernment. It takes sacrifice. It takes having a plan. And it takes responding to God's call in our lives. And that's my invitation to each of us. And so as we think about where this takes us personally, I would invite you to just read the Bible with financial eyes. Go read in Philippians. And, uh, and when Paul says, Indeed, I count everything of loss because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In other words, my wallet and the math. I count it all loss because I get to know Jesus. Pray that you'd be free from the love of money, that it wouldn't consume you. And, uh, and ask God to incline your heart, it says. Incline my heart towards you. And then again, trust God for every need that you have. Invite him to actually speak into your circumstances, your very specific circumstances, and to understand the difference between your needs and your wants. And then make a plan. Make a plan to join in with others to make a difference in God's kingdom. Let's pray together. Jesus, um, we ask you to work in our hearts to bring change, to cause us to understand your heart for this world to use your resources that you've given to us to make a difference in this world. Thank you for your wild generosity to us, that out of your riches you chose poverty so that we could become spiritually rich. Help us to, in the same way, share both our spirits and our finances with others. Amen. Thanks, John. Would you stand, please?
Oh, please. Yeah, what's going on here? <laughs> it's empty. That's so disappointing. No. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks for leading us in this conversation on stewardship. Thanks for sending in your questions. Uh, my phone was lighting up throughout the service, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to three mm -hmm. that summarize a number of different questions that, that came in. First one uh, talks about giving out, outside of the church, like mm -hmm. people who are generous and love to give, but love to give to some causes uh, directly in our city here. Is it okay to give elsewhere, like, for example, Silo Mission or Multiply to further God's kingdom, not necessarily to or through our church? Yes, but let me get to the heart of the question. The, the way I've struggled with it is, what do I do with my not enough? That's my first thing. It's like, what do I do with my not enough? Do I give it here or do I give it here? And the first challenge is the fact that I have a hard enough, a not enough feeling in my heart, the sense of scarcity. Um, if you think about the giving in the Bible, it was generosity added to generosity added to generosity, not this generosity instead of that generosity. And so I'll just tell you what we do in our home. We automate our giving as 10% of our net income. And then beyond that, we give it elsewhere. And I would encourage you to have a plan that makes sense of how you give, not just spontaneously sort of move to here and there as you feel led. Because the Bible actually, we, like there's so much we didn't cover in the New Testament where we're commanded to give and commanded to give in certain ways. And the more you have, the more you are called to take responsibility. So this is a community of a lot of have. So give to Salome Mission a lot. Mm. Give to Multiply a lot. Give everywhere a lot because God has given us a lot. Uh, there's a number of questions coming in around, like, how do I mm -hmm. actually practically get started? Because when you say, yeah, I automate 10% of my giving, for some of us, it's like, okay, yeah. uh, I can't go co like cold turkey into 10%. <laughs> how, do I, how do I start? Well, I, actually, I'll suggest that it, it might not be as hard as you think, mm. because you've got a whole bunch of little commitments that are taking up a whole bunch of money. Um, evaluate your commitments. That's one of the big ways of starting. Evaluate what your real behaviors are and then make some powerful choices. Not hard choices, powerful choices. Um, and then make a plan to get there. Uh, the thing that I shared with Levi, I said like, if you add 1% every paycheck or every other paycheck between now and 10%, you will have incrementally changed and maybe not noticed the change. Yeah. Like change zero to 10% in any given week or month, you'll notice it. But do that over 10 pay periods, and you go, that wasn't as hard as I thought. Mm -hmm. And most of us have it in our head that it's super hard, yeah. when it might not be as hard as we thought. Good, good. Last one. Mm -hmm. Many prominent churches preach that if I give to the church, God will give to me, make me rich, heal me, heal me from sickness, give me security and a long life. Does scripture teach this? No. There's lots of verses about God's blessing. But a prosperity gospel that says you give and it equals this in very practical things. Um, there's lots of other scriptures that tell us we give sacrificially even when we're suffering. And guess what? The suffering didn't change. Uh, in the midst of the struggle, I gave out of my gen. I gave or the church gave. And, uh, and they're still struggling. So there is a rich blessing to be given or to be experienced in giving. But it is not always an economic equal sign. And uh, sometimes it is. And sometimes God wildly blesses people, particularly if they have the spiritual gift of giving. If they've got an extra anointing from God to be generous, and God goes, I'm going to pour money into your lap because you're just so good at distributing it according to my values. But uh, that's not everybody's gift. But it's all of our gifts and responsibilities to figure out how to deal with the money we have. And the idea of a prosperity gospel where God is guaranteeing us success. I can't find it in Scripture in the New Testament, yeah. really. Awesome. So. Thanks, John. I want you to stand with me if you could, and I want to send you with a blessing. I didn't read any of the Scriptures out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, which talk a lot about commands around giving. You should go read them. But in the middle of this stuff about money, Paul says to Timothy, the guy he's mentoring, fight the good fight of faith. 
take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. As we use our finances, fight the good fight of faith. Amen, and go in peace.